Amazing. Cheers. Well, everyone, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, my friends, I'm delighted to welcome back one of my all-time favorite people I've ever had the privilege and honor of actually speaking to. He's the man who wrote Lost Connections and Chasing the Scream. His name is Johan Hari. He's also written a brilliant new book, which I highly encourage each and every one of you to go and get a copy of it. Australians are loving it and for damn good reason. We need this book and people all around the world are loving it too. It's called Stolen Focus. Why you can't pay attention? I mean, that is a big question. I know a lot of us are trying to figure out for ourselves and some of us don't even know that our our focus has really been stolen today. But Johan, man, can I welcome you so much back to the Storybox podcast today? Woo, I'm so fucking happy to be with you. And I am, it's funny, this experience is slightly reminding me of a time experience I had in Melbourne once, which is the only time in my entire life where I've wondered if I've actually gone insane. So I... (laughs) I flew from London to Melbourne. I can't remember where my layover was, but I could not sleep. Right. So I was awake for like two days solid. Right. And I get to the airport in Melbourne where you go to go into the city and I'm sort of standing there waiting, absolutely like delirious with tiredness. And suddenly I heard my own voice speaking, but my lips weren't moving. And I'm actually standing there and I'm like, fuck have I like is this psychosis am I developing a psychotic break what what's happening and then suddenly I realized that someone in front of me in a car was listening to the audiobook of my book Lost Connections and and if I'd had more presence of mind this has never happened to me before or since if I'd had more presence of mind I would have like leaned in and been like well hello could, could you imagine how fucking weird that would be <laughs> if you're like listening to an audiobook and then the author just literally sticks his head through the door and just starts speaking in time with the book how freaky that would be anyway all of which is to say is I was insanely tired then and I'm insanely tired now. So if I die in the course of this um, interview, please like invent some good last words and attribute them to me. The other thing, I have this slightly weird feeling whenever I speak to Australians, because uh, I absolutely love Australia. Um, but I have this weird thing that um, goes right back to the very first time I ever came to Australia. I don't know if I told you this last time we spoke, Jay, um, but I had this really weird experience where, so I had, just landed in Australia. And if my memory is right, I spoke, it was, this was either at the Sydney Opera House or in Melbourne. I gave a speech like very soon after I landed, like I, th- I thought I'd have like a couple of days to adjust. And it was like really soon afterwards, like the next day or poss- possibly even that day. And um, so I got on stage and I made like this absolutely shit joke for which I apologized, then led to this horrific and bizarre thing. So I come on stage and I go, you know, um, I have to say, uh, I'm really disappointed by Australia. And everyone looks really upset. And I said, because, you know, I, me and my grandmother, we were brought up, I was brought up by my grandmother, and we would obsessively watch The Young Doctors and Sons and Daughters, right? And which was made by Reg Grundy, who also made Neighbours um, and Home and Away. And I'm like, you know, my whole mental picture as a child came from Sons and Daughters, but I've been here for like 24 hours. And so far, no one has kidnapped me and replaced me with an identical twin I didn't know existed, right? And so people do a sort of slightly polite laugh, but not much, right? As, as is, which is what the joke deserves. Uh, and then I said, is Reg Grundy, who made that and made Neighbours, is Reg Grundy still alive? And someone in the audience says, yeah. And I said, well, God should strike Reg Grundy dead for the way he misrepresented your country to the world, right? And there's this sort of slightly, and I'm sort of realizing, oh, I've misjudged. I'm just so tired. I've misjudged. Anyway, what happens? But very soon afterwards, I turn on the television and fucking Reg Grundy died. Oh, no. Like, but now I feel like when I speak to Australians, I have the power to just strike Australians dead <laughs> by calling on God. So I'm really tempted to say to you, Pauline Hansen's still alive, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to use my evil powers. I will remain above the uh, above my capacity for evil. But um, but yeah, the so anyway, those are my feelings about Australia. Many of my complicated feelings of Australia include those two thoughts. As far as I'm aware, Pauline Hansen is still alive, and I hope that that stays that way for a long period. Yes, of time. I do not call on God. Just to no, be clear, right? A, if there is a God, which would surprise me. B, if he does follow my commands when it comes to living the life and death of Australians, which would also really, really surprise me. Please, God, make her convert to the Greens. Don't make her actually die. That would be awful. Don't wish death on anyone. Just to be clear. Thank you, God. It's actually quite interesting you should say that because there was a, when I was 12 years old, I was actually invited 
to to do a a, a sermon at my my old church and oh. Uh, I was like really, really young. I don't know why they asked a 12 year old to do a, a, a preaching sermon. Uh, it seems like I was very immature and, and too young. But anyway, in the sermon, uh, I said, I don't like Michael Jackson. I didn't even really listen to Michael Jackson's music. And I, I said this as sort of like a crass, uh, I regret it to this day because I said, I just wish Michael Jackson would just drop dead. And then <gasps> literally a week later, no. I kid you not, he passed away. And I just like, I felt this massive, like gut wrenching rip <laughs> and tear in my stomach. Cause I could not believe a, that I actually said it and B it actually came to pass. And I'm like, did I just jinx Michael Jackson's oh, death? So I completely understand. Can I just you're... say, Jay, if, if this was a science fiction novel now, it would not be a coincidence that both of us have stood up in Australia <laughs> called for the death of a prominent figure <laughs> and then it happened. This would be like the start of some weird confluence where we'd meet like eight other people who also have the power to strike people dead by Golu for it. And then we would discover we were all connected in some secret way. So yep. to be fair, the children of the world are somewhat safer as a result of your evil wishes. But um, and, and moral of the story is don't wish anyone dead. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> don't That's say it in Australia. <laughs> exactly. Just don't uh, do it, Australia. Hold on. <laughs> Just, <laughs> yeah. But there was also another quick funny story that uh, sort of reminded me of, of your fatigue. Have you ever been to like a, a one of those public toilets and you're standing there doing your business and then someone says hello to you just out of the blue, like you, you can't even see who they are. And you're so like tired and delirious. You think that they're actually talking to you. So you say hello back and you start sort of dialoguing with them. And then you realize they're actually on the phone in the cubicle and you, you just like, you, you quickly realize, hang on a minute, they're not talking to me. <laughs> and you feel really stupid <laughs> afterwards. And you're like, hang on a minute, I need some sleep. <laughs> like, it's nuts. I mean, just to be clear, Jay, there are lots of men who'd be very happy to be greeted in toilets by you, but in that <laughs> context, right? This is not, the, that's not the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not, man. But can I just say, thank you so much. I know you're extremely oh. tired and uh, I oh, really, no, no, really so am grateful. Uh, for all your time, man. Your new book is called Stolen Focus. And I guess the first question that I do have for you, well, last time we spoke, the, the first question I did ask you was towards success. But now I want to sort of dive into uh, stolen focus a bit more for, for my audience. And the first question is, how do we know that our focus has really been stolen from us? Yeah, this is exactly what I wanted to to figure out because I wrote the book because I realized with each year that passed, my attention was getting worse. And it felt like as time went by, things that required deep focus and attention that are really important to my sense of myself, like reading books, having deep conversations, watching films, were getting more and more like running up a down escalator. You know what I mean? Like I could still do them, but they were getting harder and harder. And I noticed that most people I knew seemed to also have that, that feeling that that was happening to them. Um, but I was also aware, you know, there are all sorts of impressions people have that sometimes turn out to not be the case. You know, lots of humans in the past have had this feeling, you know, you can read a letter from a thousand years ago from one monk to another, where he says basically, oh, my attention ain't what it used to be, right? So I thought, you know, maybe, maybe just every generation thinks this. Maybe every generation just thinks their attention is going to shit. Maybe it's just that I'm getting older, right? And, you know, you mistake your own deterioration for the deterioration of the world. But I kept looking at the young people in my life who often seem to be kind of whirring at the speed of Snapchat, I had a traumatic experience with one of them that perhaps we'll talk about. Um, made me think, oh, I should look into this. And, you know, even at the very start, when I was looking just at the, the, the raw figures, I was quite struck, you know, for every one child who was identified with serious attention problems when I was seven years old, there's now a hundred kids who've been identified that way. And um, the average American office worker now focuses on any one task for only three minutes. I started to think, has that always been the case? Well, let's find out. So I ended up using my training in the social sciences at Cambridge University to go on a really big journey all over the world from Melbourne to Miami, to Moscow, to Montreal, not just to cities that began with the letter M. Um, and, and I interviewed over 200 of the leading experts on attention and focus, different aspects of it. And, um, and really dug incredibly deeply into their research. And what I learned from these experts is that there's scientific evidence for 12 factors that can make your attention better 
or can make your retention worse. And the reason we know it's getting worse is because loads of the factors that have been proven to make your retention worse have been hugely rising in recent years. Now that includes some aspects of tech, but it also goes way beyond them from the air we breathe to the food we eat, from the sleep we don't get to the hours we overwork. But the, the heart of what I learned is that, that actually our attention, like you said, didn't collapse. It's been stolen from us by these big forces. And once you understand these 12 forces, it opens up a very different set of solutions that we can kind of pursue together. Do you ever think that our focus will in fact ultimately collapse or is it just going to continue to be stolen from us if we allow it to be stolen? I mean, I think it's collapsed to a staggering degree. And I guess the analogy that I, the analogy that I kept coming back to is one that was offered to me by one of the leading experts on children's attention problems in the world, Professor Joel Nigg, an amazing man who I interviewed mm. in Portland in Oregon. You know, if you look at a picture of a beach in Australia or Britain or the US in, say, 1960, and I recommend people just Google one and look at it for a minute. It, it's really weird when you look at it. At first, you'll think there's something, this is really odd, because everyone is what we would call buff or, 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 or slim, right? Mm. Or skinny, actually. Everyone. And you look at it and you're like, well, where's everyone else? <laughs> where, where are they? Right? And then you look at the figures. There were, this is not an exaggeration, there were almost no obese people in um, Australia, Britain, and the US, or in fact, anywhere in the world in 1960. And as we know, since then, there's been an explosion in obesity. You know, since then, the average American has gained 22 pounds. And that's because there was a whole series, it's not because people became greedy or lazy or the many kind of ugly, stigmatizing things that we say about overweight people, and I include myself in the category of overweight. It, it's because a whole set of changes happened in the way we live, right? Um, we built cities that it's impossible to bike and walk around. The entire food supply system changed, which by the way is also completely fucking our ability to focus and pay attention. We can talk about it if you like. Um, and we became more stressed, which makes us want to comfort eat more. So we had a, all sorts of big structural changes in the way we live that led to the obesity crisis. And what Professor Nigg argued is, we, is that we need to ask, I think rightly, is something similar happening to our attention? He said, we should ask, have we created what he called, what he said we might want to think of as an attentional pathogenic environment? One in which it's getting, just like we live in what's called an obesogenic environment, one where it's easy to become obese and hard to stay you know, as fit as possible. It could be, he, he asked, that we're living in an environment that's making it very hard for us all to pay attention. Um, and I, I think ultimately the, the evidence suggests that that, that that question he's asking, the answer is yes, for all sorts of reasons I'm sure we'll explore. Let and could it collapse to totally? And um, just to go back to what you're saying, Jay, so it was a long way of answering your question, which is, could it collapse totally? I mean, I think it has declined to a level that would have seemed unbelievable mm. when I was a teenager, for example, which is not that long ago, I'm 43, right? So I think we're on a shocking downward trajectory. In the same way, it would have been, un if you'd gone back to a beach in 1960 and said, by 2020, a majority of Americans will be overweight or obese, I mean, I think people would have thought that was completely ludicrous, right? By the time you get to 1970, you've got some people warning about it. You've got other people saying, oh, this is a moral panic. Don't be ridiculous. How could that happen? And um, it's interesting to debate about if that analogy is right, and I think it is, whether there are reasonable people who disagree, Where are, what, what's the equivalent year of where we are, right? Are we in 1970 in the obesity crisis? Are we in 1980? How much further can this go? And I would argue... Um, I mean, we certainly have further to go. We, there are lots of pockets of attention we can, we, we still have. Um, and there are lots of factors that are poised to invade those remaining pockets. Yeah. I mean, I'm 25 at the moment. And, and after I read this book, uh, I sort of realized how quickly it's just come upon all of us really in, in the current society that we're living in. It, it's, it's going, it's becoming even quicker than I watched The Social Dilemma too and on technology and just realized hang on a minute we're just being sucked in even more so in today's day and age and it's it seems like to me that it is getting staggeringly worse and our kids are like their attention span is dwindling ever so thinly uh, up until the point where i think it's like 10 seconds now and they swipe to the next one then the next one like how 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 short do we need to get it until we lose a child's attention completely and they just struggle to really focus at all. 
on anything. You know, it, was this, it was an epiphany about that that made me realize I had to write the book. So the, the way I open the book is by talking about my godson, who I call Adam in the book. It's, it's not his real name. And, um, you know, when he, when he was nine, he developed this brief but really intense obsession with Elvis. And it was unbelievably cute because he didn't know that Elvis had become this weird, cheesy cliche. So he was probably the last person in the entire world to do an int- a totally sincere impression of Elvis Presley. And uh, it was adorable. And How innocent. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it was so cute. And every night when I tucked him in, he would get for a while, he got me to tell him the story of Elvis's life again and again. Um, and obviously I tried to skip over the bit at the end where Elvis like shits himself to death on the toilet. And, <laughs> and... And one night when I was tucking him in, I mentioned, you know, that Elvis lived in a place called Graceland. And he looked at me very intensely and he said, Johan, will you take me to Graceland one day? And I was like, sure. The way you do with like nine-year-olds knowing that next week you want to go to Legoland or whatever. And he said, no, do you really mean it? Do you swear one day you will take me to Graceland? And I was like, I absolutely promise. And I didn't think in that moment again for 10 years until everything had gone wrong. So um, he dropped out of school when he was 15. And by the time he was 19, he literally, this is not an exaggeration, spent almost every waking moment alternating between his iPhone and his iPad in this kind of blur of, you know, YouTube, porn, WhatsApp, just, just this. And it really was like, he was, like I said, he was whirring at the speed of Snapchat, right? When nothing still or serious could touch him. And one day we were sitting on my sofa over there and he was, um, oh, so it's funny, I feel a bit emotional thinking about it. He was, he, I'd been trying to talk to him all day and just, I couldn't get any traction with him. And um, to be honest, I wasn't that much better, right? I was looking at my own devices. I was disgusted by myself. And I suddenly remembered this moment all these years before. And I was like, hey, let's go to Graceland. And he was like, what the fuck are you talking about? I didn't even remember this moment all those years before. And I reminded him, he still didn't remember. But I could see, I said to him, look, we have to break this numbing routine, right? This is no way to live. In fact, let's go all over the South. We're going on a big journey. Um, but <clears throat> you've got to promise one thing, which is that you'll leave your phone in the hotel when we go around. Because there's no point going if I'm just going to be looking at your phone the whole time. And he thought about it. And I'm sure sincerely, he absolutely promised. And whatever it was, two, three weeks later, we took off from London to New Orleans, which is where we went first. And a couple of weeks after that, we we got to, to Memphis and went to Graceland. And when you arrive at the gates of Graceland now, there's no person whose job is to show you around. This is even before COVID. What happens is they hand you an iPad and the iPad shows you around. You put in earbuds and the iPad shows you around. So you know, it says go left, go right. It describes the room you're in, tells you a bit about its history. And in each room, there's a sort of representation of that room on the iPad, right? Picture of it. So what happens is everyone just walks around Graceland staring at their iPad. And I'm sort of getting weirdly irritable as I'm sort of walking around and sort of trying to make eye contact with people to be like, oh, this is funny. We're the people who traveled thousands of miles and actually looked at what we traveled to see. But When we got to the jungle room, which was Elvis's favorite room, it's a kind of fake jungle. There was a Canadian couple next to us. And the man turned to his wife and he said, honey, this is amazing. Look, if you swipe left, you can see the jungle room to the left. And if you swipe right, you can see the jungle room to the right. And I I laughed out loud. I thought he was kidding. Mm. And I turned and him and his wife are just swiping back and forth. It's just like, yeah, wow. And I sort of leaned over and I said, but Hey, sir, there's, there's an old fashioned form of swiping you could do. It's called turning your head. Cause look, we're actually in the jungle room. You don't need to look at it on an iPad. We're there. We're actually there. And they looked at me like I was insane, backed away. And I turned to my godson to laugh about how mad the world's gone. And he was standing in a corner staring at his phone. Cause from the minute we landed, he just could not stop. He was just obsessively looking at Snapchat and other forms of social media. And I went up to him and I just said, look, I know you're afraid of missing out, but this is guaranteeing that you'll miss out, right? You're not present at your own life. You're not, you're not showing up for the events of your own existence. And in a rage, I did that thing that is never a good idea to do, do, to do with teenagers. I tried to grab the phone off him and he stormed off, understandably. 
and I wandered around Memphis myself, my own, on my own. And that night I found him in the Heartbreak Hotel up the street where we were staying. He was sitting by the guitar shaped swimming pool. And I apologized for getting so angry. And he, and he didn't look up from his phone, but he said, I know something's really wrong, but I don't know what it is. And I, and I suddenly realized that we had come all this way to get away from this crisis of not being present, but we couldn't escape because it was everywhere. It reminded me, I saw a play once by the comedian Ben Elton, who now in Australia, actually, who, where um, the world is about a world that's really polluted and, and the person can't breathe. And he smashes a window to open, to get let some air in, but there's no air outside either. And so he just can't breathe. And it felt, it felt like that. It's like, oh, where do we turn? If the, everywhere we looked, this problem that we'd come here to escape was, was there. And that's when I thought, oh, okay, I need to figure out what's happening here. You know, because for a long time, I've been thinking about writing this book, but I've been putting it off. I think because I was afraid, I think I thought, what if you just discover we're fucked, right? This just feels like such a big problem. Sorry, I'm very sweary today. I apologize. This happens to me when I'm tired and when I talk to Australians. Um, <laughs> the, the, yeah, I think I was afraid of looking at it. But I'm really glad I did because actually I learned there are loads of solutions that are really practical. Is there only these 12 causes for stolen focus or are there more than that? I'm, I'm sure there's more. Those were the 12 that I could sort of find one. evidence for. I mean, there'll, there'll be other things that emerge over time. So I'll give you an example of one because I think a lot of people it sound a bit weird when we talk about these, these 12 um, things. And you, I'll give you an example of one that I think will be playing out for almost everyone listening today, right? Yeah. I went to MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, to interview a man named Professor Earl Miller, who's one of the leading neuroscientists in the world and a completely amazing man. And um, he said to me, look, there's one thing you need to understand about the human brain more than anything else. You can only consciously think about one or two things at a time. That's it. This is a fundamental limitation of the human brain. The human brain has not significantly changed in 40,000 years. It's not going to change on any time scale. Any of us are going to see, you could only think about one or two things at a time. But what's happened is we've fallen from mass delusion. The average American teenager now believes they can follow six or seven forms of media at the same time. So what happens is scientists get people into labs, not just teenagers, older people as well. And they get them to think they're doing more than one thing at a time. And they study them to see what happens. And what they discover is always the same. You can't do more than one thing at a time. What you do is you juggle very quickly between the things you're doing. Your consciousness kind of papers over it, you don't realize, but you're juggling. And it turns out that juggling, that focusing, refocusing, refocusing, what was that on Facebook? What did he just say to me? What did Jay just ask me? That, that comes with a really big cost. The kind of technical term for it is the switch cost effect. When you try and do more than one thing at a time, you will do all the things you're trying to do much less competently. You'll make more mistakes. You'll remember less of what you do. You'll be much less creative. And that sounds like, a, I remember when Professor Miller first explained that to me, I remember thinking, yeah, okay, I get it, but that must be a small effect, right? Turns out that effect is huge. I'll give you just one, there's loads of scientific examples, loads of science on this, but I'll give you an example of one study, a small study, but backed up by wider evidence that really drove this home for me, Hewlett Packard, the printer company, got a scientist in to study some of their workers. And he split their workers into two groups. And one group was told, just get on with whatever your task is, and you're not going to be interrupted. Mm. And the second group was told, get on with your task, whatever it is, but you're going to have to answer a heavy load of email and phone calls. So sort of like how most of us live now, right? Yeah. And then he studied both of them in order to see, see, what, um, see what happened. The group that had not been interrupted at the end of this experiment, he scored 10 IQ points higher on an intelligence test than the group that had been interrupted. To give you a sense of how big that is, if you and me sat down and smoked a fat spliff together now, Jay, our IQs would go down by five points. So being chronically distracted, at least in the short term, was twice as bad for your intelligence as getting stoned, you'd be better off sitting at your desk, smoking a fat spliff and doing one thing at a time than you would sitting at your desk, not smoking a spliff and being constantly interrupted. Now, to be clear, for your focus, it'd be better to neither smoke a spliff nor be interrupted. But 
the so you can see this is a huge effect. One other study by Professor Larry Rosen, for example, found that if you receive eight text messages an hour, which does not sound like much to me, your your uh, your intelligence, your understanding of the main thing you're trying to focus on goes down by thirty percent. That's staggering. I, I would argue we're all losing a big percentage of our brain power all the time. This is why Professor Miller said that we're currently living in a perfect storm of cognitive degradation as a result of all this interruption. Does that ring true to you, Jay? It does for me because, yeah, I've noticed I've noticed that <laughs> on several occasions. Yeah. <laughs> and when I can't handle more than seven text messages all at once, I just can't. Like, <laughs> I, I kind of get annoyed. <laughs> like, just yeah. leave me alone. <laughs> Um, yes, fuck off world. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but it's interesting for me when I am engaged in one particular task and how easy it is for something else just to come up. And, and it, 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 it kind of makes me wonder, is multitasking, is that really just a thing? Is that, or is that just a massive lie that we've been told? <laughs> Well, it's interesting. So multitasking is a term that comes from computers, right? Computers can multitask. They've got multiple processes. They can multitask, right? So we took a term that was designed for things that are nothing like us. That's not how our brains work. That's not who we are and applied it to ourselves, but we are not machines. And when we try to live by the logic of machines, we start to malfunction. It just doesn't work, right? So, and you're absolutely right. If you think about what you're saying about text, Professor Michael Posner at the University of Oregon discovered if you're interrupted, it takes you on average 23 minutes to get back to the level of focus that you had before you were interrupted. But a lot of us are never getting 23 minutes back. And so you think about if someone texts you and they expect you to immediately text them back and afterwards they're like, why didn't you text me back? It would have only taken you 10 seconds. You want to go, no. It would have taken me 10 seconds plus 23 minutes to refocus my mind to the level I was at before. It's interesting. So that switching is one of the 12 causes that I write about. And it, I think when we think about it, what I learned from like obviously spending so long looking at the evidence is for each of these causes, there's sort of two levels at which we've got to tackle this problem, right? Mm. For each of these 12 factors that are sort of pouring acid on our attention. I think of them as defense and offense, right? There are all sorts of things we've got to do to defend ourselves and our children at an individual level um, from these forces that are doing this to us, right? And I'm passionately in favor of all those individual steps. I go through dozens of them in the book. They're really important. I'll give you an example of one of them. Where is it? Hmm. Somewhere in this, this room is too dark now for me to see it, but that's weird. It must be in the other room. Um, I own something called a K-safe, right? So K-Safe is a plastic, I swear these people should be paying me fucking commission. Anyway, the plastic set, K-Safe is a plastic safe. You take off the lid, you put in your phone, you put on the lid, you turn the dial, and it will lock your phone away for anything between five minutes and a whole day, right? I will not sit down to watch a film with my boyfriend unless we both imprison our phones. When people want to come around for dinner, everyone's got to put their phone in the phone jail. Um, and, and you can see, uh, what I always say to people is, um, you know, think about anything you've ever achieved in your life that you're proud of, whether it's starting a business, being a good parent, learning to play the guitar, whatever it is, that thing that you're proud of required a huge amount of sustained focus and attention. And when focus and attention break down, your ability to solve your problems breaks down, your ability to achieve your goals breaks down, you become a, a radically diminished version of yourself. And you can see when people, even, even in a small situation, like someone coming around for two hours and imprisoning their phone in a way they haven't done in a long time, you, it's itchy and difficult. And then you get the pleasure of focus, which is so much greater. But the reason I say there's two levels and why I think my book is quite different to other books about attention is I want to be really honest with people. I'm passionately in favor of these defensive measures they're really good and they've significantly boosted my attention, but they'll only get you so far because at the moment it's like someone is pouring itching powder over us all the time. And then they're leaning forward and going, you know what, mate, um, you might want to learn how to meditate. Then you wouldn't scratch so much. And you want to go, fuck you. I'll learn to meditate. That's really valuable, but you need to stop pouring fucking itching powder over me. You can't, right? We, we, we need to deal with the factors that are actually doing this to us. And again, that can sound quite fancy. So I'll give you just a specific one. There's a lot, obviously we go through lots of them, but 
to give you an example of one that's, that helps solve that this specific problem switching that we're talking about. So loads of people listening will have heard me just talk about the case A. And I use that case A for four hours a day. I couldn't write my books if I didn't, right? I also have an app on my laptop that cuts you off from the internet called Freedom. But loads of people will hear me say that and they'll just think, well, fuck off. I can't do that. My boss could message me. I've got a job, right? How can I do that? Right. And there's a solution to this. Um, so because they're absolutely right, they will not experience me talking about the case safe as a lovely piece of self-help advice. It's like a fucking taunt. It's like going up to a homeless person in the street and going, mate, um, have you ever considered having a really nice steak in that restaurant? Don't you think that would cheer you up? And it's like, right, they won't let me in. I can't do it. Right. The, which is why you need this, this bigger layer. So I'll give you an example of it that I think makes it much clearer. In 2018 in France, they had a huge crisis of what they called le burnout, which I don't think I need to translate. And French government under pressure from trade unions, and it would never have happened if there hadn't been pressure from trade unions, set up a commission to figure out why French workers getting so burned out. It was head, headed by a guy called Bruno Metling, who's the head of Orange, their biggest, one of their biggest telecoms companies. And he looks at all the evidence, he's trying to figure out what's going on. And he discovered that 35% of French workers felt they could never stop checking their phones or their email because their boss could message them at any time of the day or night. Yeah. And if they didn't answer, they'd be in trouble. Now, I remember when I was a kid, the only people who were on call were doctors and they weren't on call all the time, right? In fact, the only person who was on call all the time would have been the prime minister. And we've gone from it being almost literally nobody being on call to almost half the economy being on call all the time, right? So if you're in that position, and I, I can give you all the lovely advice about, you know, you need to sleep more. You need to have periods where you're just completely off. Like, just go, fuck you, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. Which is why French workers said, we need to act on this. They collectively demanded action. And the French government introduced a law, very simple law, it's called the right to disconnect. And it gives every French worker two rights. The first right, is that your, your work hours have to be legally defined in your contract. And the second right is, unless you're being paid overtime, you have the legal right to not check your phone or your email when your work hours are up. That's it. So I went to Paris to interview people about this. Just before I was there, rent a kill got fined 70,000 euros for trying to get one worker to check his email an hour after he left work and telling him off because he hadn't done it. Right. Now you can see how that's a collective change. This is part of the offense, right? We've got to go on the offense against the forces that are doing this to us and take them on and tame them. There's lots of other forces that do this as well. I'm sure we're going to get to lots of them, but you can see how that's a collective change that, we, that will only happen if we fight for it, that sets people free to make the individual changes that lots of them want to make. So we have all of these causes we've got with one exception, we've got to have these two levels, right? The, the defense and the offense. It kind of reminds me of when I was in real estate. So I was pretty much always on call with my boss. I had oh. two phones and I just remember the, the nerve wracking feeling. I was constantly mm. on edge. Like I was worried that my phone would ring or it would buzz with a text message. So I was never not looking at the phone and it was right. dangerous because even when I was driving, my phone would, would message or, or ring. And if I didn't pick it up, then I get in trouble. I get this massive stern lecture. Why didn't you like pick it up or, you know, all, all those sorts of things, which is dangerous. It's like, not only is it dangerous for me being on the road, but it's also dangerous for my, my mentality or my mental health really, which sort of leads me to my next question, Johan, which is how has our focus being stolen from us? How has that contributed to the massive mental health crisis that we are seeing in our in our world being played out. I mean, you've written a book on mental health, lost connections uh, and depression and anxiety and all those things. So how has focus contributed to all that? So I think there's all sorts of ways, but the most important, I think, um, possibly not the most important, but one of the most important is that if you can't pay attention, you just become much less competent, right? An individual who can't, and we all see this with children, obviously the last third of my book is about kids, what's happened to them. Yep. If you can't pay attention, you can't do the things you want to do very well, right? Or you do them a lot less well. And when you, when you become incompetent or more incompetent, you feel worse about yourself, right? But it's interesting, there's this amazing man I interviewed in Moscow called Dr. James Williams, who really helped me to think about 
this in a deeper way that I think sort of gets at some of what you're you're, you're asking about, Jade. That mm. so he worked at Google at the he was a very senior strategist at Google, um, and he became horrified by what they were doing to people's attention. I'm sure we'll get to that later. Mm. He had this moment. He was speaking at a tech conference to like people designing the apps that everyone listening that you use every day that your kids use. And he said to the people there, if there's anyone here who wants to live in the world that we're creating, please put up your hand. Mm -hmm. And not one of them put up their hands. And he quit and became, I would argue, the leading philosopher of attention in the world. He's based at Oxford. I interviewed him in Moscow because his wife works there. And he, he developed this really interesting uh, I think much more layered and interesting way of thinking about attention. So he argues there's sort of three kinds of attention. I would argue there's four, and I know he agrees with this because I put it to him. So the first level of attention um, is what's called your spotlight, right? So your spotlight is your, you think of it as a spotlight if you direct your spotlight on a stage, right? It's your ability to narrow down your attention to do one immediate thing, right? So let's say I've just finished this can of Coke Zero, Let's say I decide to go to my fridge to get another can of Coke Zero. And let's say on the way I get distracted by a phone call uh, or text. And halfway there, I just forget why I went there and I come back to you. Mm -hmm. So that would be my spotlight being interrupted, right? So your spotlight is your ability to do it, to filter out the shit around you and just do one immediate short-term task. I think everyone listening can see how our spotlight is being interrupted and interfered with all the time, right? We go to more detail if you want. The next level of attention is what he calls your starlight. And that's not your ability to do your short-term stuff. That's your ability to do more medium and long-term things like, you know, I want to set up a business. I want to get a new job. I want to write a book. Um, I want to be a good parent, whatever it might be, right? So it's called your starlight because when you're when you're trying to find your way in the desert, you look up at the stars and you're like, oh, that's the direction I'm traveling in, right? And he argues that you're our starlight is being interfered with, right? If you don't get any time to rest, any time to think, any time to let your mind wander, you just your ability to perceive to pursue your long-term goals starts to get, get fucked with. But then he argues there's a layer even beyond that, which he calls your daylight. And um, your daylight is your ability to even know what your medium and long-term goals are. How do you know you want to start a business? How do you know what it means to be a good parent? Um, how do you know you want to write a book, right? You have to have periods of contemplation and rest to formulate your goals. And it's called your daylight because you can see a room most clearly when it's flooded with daylight, right? And if you don't ever get any space to think, how do you even form? And you can see how if you lose your daylight, he argues that it leads to something called decohering, which is where you make less sense to yourself. You, you get less sense like, well, who am I? What, what do I want? You just sort of feel like you're a pinball on a pinball machine to switch the metaphor, right? You're just being whacked around by life. You're not, you're not, you're not the agent of your life. Think about my godson, you know, when he was so adult. You're not the agent of your life. You're just someone sort of being batted around. And at the fourth level, I would argue, is your stadium lights, which is our ability to see each other and formulate goals as a society, right? I think a lot about the Black Summer you guys had just before COVID. When you think about how terrifying what happened in Australia was, and Australia still doesn't have a climate change policy, right? After your country fucking burned down, you still don't have one, right? Now, there's lots of reasons why I don't want to be naive about this, but I think all over the world, people are really struggling to formulate collective goals. And I don't think it's a coincidence that we're having a huge inability to pursue our political goals at the same time as we've our ability to pay attention has collapsed, right? To build political goals, you have to be able to listen to each other. You have to be able to focus. You have to be able to hold politicians accountable over a long and sustained period. It, adult populations who just can't focus can't, can't do that. So if you think about it, you can see how, oh, that's weird. I've got my notifications switched off. That's, it's telling me something weird. Oh, sorry. Um, you can see how, um, a society that's lost those four layers of attention or where they are, hasn't entirely lost them, but where they're deteriorating is going to be a society with a lot more anxiety, a lot more depression. If you can't achieve your goals, you know, if you can't solve either your individual problems or big problems, 
you're just gonna it's gonna be a society where more people feel like shit for obvious reasons yeah <laughs> so spotlight <laughs> it doesn't have to be this way right the no. most encouraging thing is that, that actually there there are solutions here right and that mm. and that i've sort of seen them in place in why is my thing doing that that's really weird hang on uh sorry um the uh and i saw those solutions being put into place from new zealand to france right so um yeah the, we, we're doing the pessimistic bit at the moment but we'll get to the optimism mm. soon We'll definitely get to the optimism soon. <laughs> I just want to stay on the the pessimist, pessimistic <laughs> okay, dive don't for kill a yourself. <laughs> uh, you've got spotlight, starlight, daylight, and the stadium live, which I think everyone should go learn more about. And it's in your book, right, Johan? So you talk more about that. <laughs> yeah, I like <laughs> um, you plugging my book. I like this. Great. Go on, focus. <laughs> uh, go and get a copy of it. Trust me. <laughs> if you're enjoying this conversation, you enjoy the book a lot better. Oh. Trust me. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, like, staying on the topic of kids, because I think if we can yeah. reverse what's happened to kids, then we there's hope <laughs> for all of us. Um, but how has uh, stolen focus contributed to the problem of a lot of young people uh, not being creative or, or are you seeing that the lack of creativity is caused by our focus and attention being stolen from us? Oh, this is, of all the 12 causes that I write about, I think this is the one that I found most difficult to look at because it's so upsetting, but also most encouraging because there's an answer that is free and of all of them, relatively easy. So there's lots of things that are bearing on kids' ability to focus and pay attention. Uh, children sleep 85 minutes less than they did a century ago. Sleep is essential for attention. In kids, when they don't sleep, it will manifest often as mania and hyperactivity. The food we feed our children is profoundly damaging their ability to focus and pay attention. We can talk about that. Obviously, there are huge components in the tech that are damaging our focus and attention that we can deal with. I'll talk about that later, I'm sure. Uh, the way our school system works, if you wanted to design a school system that would ruin children's attention, you would design the one we have now, which is not at all the fault of, of teachers who never wanted this system. But I think the, the biggest one and the easiest one to solve um, is uh, something else. So we've had an explosion in children's attention problems at the same time as we had a profound transformation of childhood. And I tell this story in the book through one of my heroes, a woman named Lenore Skenazi. Um, and, I, and I tell it through her story, not because she's part of the problem, problems are easy to describe, but because she's built the solution, one that everyone listening can implement. So Lenore grew up in a suburb of Chicago in the 1960s. And that meant that from when she was five years old, she would leave the house on her own and walk the 15 minutes to school without an adult. And generally she'd bump into all the other five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, because every child walked to school on their own. And when the kids got to the school, there was a busy road. So there was a 10 year old boy whose job was to help the five year olds cross the street. Right. And then school would end at three o'clock. Lenore would leave on her own. She'd wander around the neighborhood with all her friends and find her way home for like six o'clock, whenever she was hungry. Right. So she would just play freely with the kids for hours. They'd make up their own games, do whatever they wanted and find their way home. By the time Lenore was a, um, was a mother herself, in, she was in, living in Queens in, in New York by then, that had ended, right? You were expected to deliver your children to school like a package and be waiting, standing there when, when it ended. In fact, by 2003, um, only 10% of American children ever played outside without an adult supervising them. And of that 10%, I think they got like 12 minutes a week. So it literally just ended, right? So even before COVID, where we can all see whatever your position on the restrictions, um, the, uh, and there's reasonable people on both sides, although I'm in favour of the restrictions uh, broadly, um, we can all see that imprisoning our kids has had a terrible effect. Uh, but actually, the truth is, we were very close to imprisoning our kids before COVID, right? We just st stepped it up. Actually, if you look at the overall trend, um, and it turns out that childhood that we've lost, right, that I also had, right? I'm sort of the last, I'm 43. I'm essentially the last age group that had that in Britain. Um, contains loads of things that are essential for children to fully develop focus and attention. The first thing, and I know this is a real no shit Sherlock scientific discovery, 
is exercise, right? Children who run around, who run around a lot, develop more brain connections and can pay attention better, right? Taking away the ability of children to run around is catastrophic for attention and focus. Um, Professor Joel Nigg, who I mentioned before, has done has written really movingly about this. The single best thing you can do for kids who can't focus is let them go and run around and let them come back, right? We are the first society ever in all of human history that has tried to get children to sit still for eight hours a day. It's madness, right? Um, but there's actually something even deeper than that. And Dr. Isabel Benke, the great Chilean scientist, has done amazing work on this. It turns out when children play freely without adults standing over them and supervising them, they learn how to use their attention. They learn what they find interesting, which is really important for attention. They learn how to persuade other kids to pay attention to them. They learn how to focus on what other kids are trying to get them to focus on. Um, they learn how to feel competent. So you climb a tree, you make a mistake, injure, you get scared, but you overcome it. You, you learn how to regulate your anxiety, which is really important for attention. Anxiety kills attention. Yeah. And what happened is in the space of one generation, we just took it all away, right? And letting kids play where an adult is standing over them, enforcing the rules, that just doesn't do it. They don't learn the attention that way. It's, it's like the difference between kind of processed junk food and, you know, nutritious food that occurred in nature, right? They're just different things. Yeah. Um, and so Lenore was seeing all of this. She understood all of this intellectually. And at first she thought, well, the solution is to just persuade individual parents of everything we just said to let their kids play outdoors again, right? So she would talk to parents and she'd say things like, tell me about something you did when you were a child that you loved that you don't allow your own children to do. And people would say, oh, I used to ride my, my bike in the woods. I used to all sorts of things. But what she discovered is it doesn't really work just doing this at an individual level. If you're the only person who lets your child out, you look, you look crazy. The child gets scared. In fact, often people will call the police if they see a child on their own now, right? Yeah. So you can see it just doesn't work. So what Lenore did is build the bigger solution. She runs a group called Let Grow. And what Let Grow do is they go to whole schools and whole communities, and they persuade everyone to give the kids increasing levels of independence, building up to playing outdoors. So of all the conversations I had for the book, I think the most moving was in... Um, it was in Long Island in a Let Grow program. Um, by the way, it's letgrow.org. Everyone listening who's got a kid, go to that site. I really can't recommend it highly enough. And so it was this boy, I've spent a lot of time with a lot of Let Grow projects, but this boy, I'll never forget him. He was a 14-year-old boy, big, tall. He was taller than me, right? Strapping 14-year-old boy, I'm not sure, right? Tall boy. And until this program had begun nine months before, he had never been allowed to play outside his house on his own. His parents wouldn't even let him go for a run around the block. I asked him why. And he said, because my parents are afraid of all these kidnappings, he said. Mm. This is a town in Long Island where the French bakery is across the street from the olive oil store. And he had a level of fear that would be appropriate if he lived in Medellin at the height of the Pablo Escobar terror, right? Or Syria. And then this program began. And all the kids started to play outdoors. And I said to him, what did you do? And he said, well, we played ball games for a while. And then he said, we went into the woods, even though our phones didn't work in the woods, they didn't have any signal. And he said that with complete awe, as if he was telling me he'd hold, held his breath for like two days. And, and, and I said, what did you do in the woods? And he said, oh, we, we built a fort together. And now we go and sit in the fort and we build other things. And as he was describing this, maybe this sounds melodramatic, but it didn't feel, it, it feels like an accurate description. It was like watching this young man come to life, right? I thought about so many children I know who never get to explore anything except on Fortnite or World of Warcraft. We can hardly be surprised they become obsessed with them. And that's the only zone of exploration and freedom we ever give them. And, you know, Lenore was with me that day when I met that boy. And after he left, she said to me, Think about all of human history, right? Think about, she didn't say this, but think about going back 60,000 years in Australia. Young people had to go out and explore. They had to map the territory. 
they had to they had to figure out how things worked, right? They had to build things. And then we took it all away from them. And those boys, given a tiny little sliver of freedom, what did they do? They went into the woods and they built a fort because this is so deep in our nature. And, and you know, I argue for lots of big things we need to do to restore attention. But one of the biggest ones I think is we have to restore human childhood. We do not give our children a childhood that our recent ancestors or any ancestors would recognize as a human childhood, right? And one of the advantages of this, this change, as opposed to some of the other big changes I think we have to make is this is free and you don't have to take on any vested interests, right? I would argue every school in Australia should have a let grow program. Every single one. We can restore child. And this is something you could get, you know, the most right-wing person on the Gold Coast and the, you know, the most kind of, you know, lefty person in King's Cross in Sydney are going to agree on this. We need to restore childhood. And I think if anything good can come out of the terrible tragedy that we've all experienced in the last two years, one of the things it's taught us is, huh, turns out imprisoning kids makes them feel like shit, right? And really stunts them. Okay, let's think about the fact we were imprisoning our kids long before the COVID virus, ever COVID-19 ever mutated, right? Um, what can we learn from that? We can learn that we don't have to do, to do childhood this way. Um, and it's interesting just to say one last thing about it. Lenore, you know, Lenore made this other epiphany, which is she used to ex try to explain to people how low the risk to their children is, right? She'd say, look, violence has massively fallen since the 1960s. And that's not because we imprison our children because violence has fallen against adults and you know, adults still walk around, right? Um, she used to explain to people, your child is three times more likely to be hit by lightning than be kidnapped. And if I said to you, I'm not going to let my child out to play because I think they might be hit by lightning, you'd think I was insane, right? But what she realized is intellectually explaining these things to people doesn't work, right? If we were good at calculating odds, you know, I've spent a lot of the pandemic in Las Vegas. If we were good at calculating odds, Las Vegas would not be in business, right? The lottery would not be a popular thing. What works, Lenore said, is they've got to try it. And they let their child out and they're terrified and they're sick. And their child comes back a little bit sweaty, having faced a challenge. And, and they're like, that's my boy, right? He can do something I didn't think he could do. The joy of seeing your children grow and become competent. At the moment, we're making our children incompetent. And it makes them anxious because to become competent, you've got to be given escalating levels of challenges, right? You don't, they shouldn't be given, just thrown out in, you know, with nothing. They've got to be given some protection, but escalating levels of challenges. And we don't do that, right? Or we do it in a very stunted and bizarre way. Um, so yeah, Lenore is, the, every now and then in life, you meet people who just embody, so bravely embody the solution to a problem. And there are lots of other people I met for the book like this. You mentioned, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about Tristan Harris and other people, but yeah, I just love Lenore. And I think she's absolutely right. We can absolutely do that. Parents these days compared to say parents, when I was growing up, like my parents didn't really care if I went outside and, you know, played, we used to play out in the streets with the neighbor's kids. We used to fall over. If we fell over, you know, you get, you live. It's fine. Exactly. If you get a broken bone, it's all good. But parents these days, especially with what they listen to and see on the media, it's kind of like, oh, we've got to put these kids in this bubble of protection. But the thing is you can't always protect your kid. Like you, unless you just keep that kid at home, not doing a thing at all, but the kid's got to, think about the developmental challenges that kids can actually have, like the social impacts at the same time. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it only takes one parent to really complain to the school board before they start changing the, the policies and everything like that. And we start like seeing this massive, massive shift in the way our kids can be creative, uh, the way our kids' mental health is, all this stuff. I've seen the, the same thing because I work in a school-like environment and even with, with um, I used to do other school care and this was not that long ago. This is like 2018, 2019 when I was doing it. And I was shocked. Like kids weren't even allowed to play outside with a ball. They had to have these structured routines in after school care. And the kids would complain to me. They say, Jay, we just want to play. We just want to have fun. But 
the fun was really being taken away from them. And I thought it was like a massive, massive disgrace because I, I just wanted them to to let loose, like go for it. I don't care. <laughs> have as much fun yeah. as you want. And your instinct is the sanest instinct. And it's it's really important to stress the parents who are so afraid, they 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 are sincerely acting out of love. Yeah. But what we have to explain to them is that th- this is not the way to love your child, right? This th- the way to love your child is to help your child and equip your child to function in the world, right? And this, and, and at some level, almost all those parents know this, right? It's rare you'll get a parent where you, you talk, and obviously I've been talking about this a lot. It's rare you'll get a parent who really, they know this, right? They can see how recent a change this is. And it, this is so important because, I mean, it's important for so many reasons. And it's important we get all the other factors, right? That are harming children's attention. Obviously there's only one of many. Although I think I would argue it is the biggest, um, one of the biggest, but one of the joint biggest. Um, but 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 we've got. Um, I, I really feel like fixing this one is within our. Gr- all of them can be fixed, but I really feel like this one is within our grasp. Um, although it makes me think about what you were saying about your parents used to, you know, my 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 parents have a highly negligent. There's a photo of me and my mother. When I'm six months old, she's breastfeeding me, smoking and resting the ashtray on my stomach. And when I discovered this photo like a couple of years ago, I thought, oh, I'll show it to her. She'd feel guilty. She said, she's Scottish. She said, you were a difficult baby. I needed that cigarette. You can't. <laughs> she was <went> completely <laughs> unrepentant. And her her level of neglect is, um, so to understand this thing I'm about to say, you have to understand that there were, there was a pair of serial killers in Britain called Fred and Rosemary West who murdered uh, two of their children and lots of other people. And uh, when my my um, oldest um, nephew Josh was born years ago, um, my sister was very anxious. You know, she was a new mother, and my mother said, "Darling, you, it's very hard for your children to actually die. Even Fred and Rosemary West, only two of their children actually died." Right? I was like, "Is that's your parenting advice? Like Fred and Rosemary West? Some of Fred and Rosemary West's children survive." But yeah, so that's my mother is Glaswegian. So that sort of Glaswegian parenting is basically why are you talking to me? I'm busy smoking. Um, so although my mother was at the, at the start of the COVID crisis, uh, I think possibly the happiest moment of my mother's entire life, she smoked 70 a day, was when there, there were early reports. I think they turned out not to be right. The heavy smokers seem to be dying of COVID at a lower rate than other people. My mother phoned me. She was like, oh, my life. People have told me since I was 12 years old to stop smoking. I'm going to go to the funeral of every one of those cunts and I'm going to stub up my cigarette on the fucking grave. And I was like, she was like filled with joy at the prospect of their deaths. So, uh, yeah. Uh, your mother's a character. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she's, she's more fun when she's not your mother, but yeah, the, she has many good qualities as well. But uh, yeah. I'll tell you a quick funny story, staying yeah, on the topic of uh, of being kids. I promise we'll get to the, the fixes in just a second. But when I was, I think, five or six years old, we lived in a neighborhood where there was reports of this guy who had kidnapped kids up, living up the street and he was at home under house arrest, that sort of thing. Um, this, like, back in the day when you were allowed to really do that and, and the mum was actually looking after the kid, probably had mental problems we we don't know the full extent of things but my mom told me specifically she's like do not go up or anywhere near that house we're at, we're at the bottom <laughs> of the street this, is going. <laughs> this, is, this, this guy was at the top of the street so anyway one day i just decided you know what's the harm of that so i decided to <laughs> go up and knock on the door of this this kidnapper's <laughs> house just to see if it was real if mom was telling the truth to me or not Anyway, this nice lady, she opens the door and she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, does the kidnapper live here? And she's like, what are you talking about? (laughs) And uh, she sent me on my way. Thank God she did that. (laughs) I remember getting back home and telling mum, she goes, where have you been? She's like, I went up to the kidnapper's house. You lied to me. And then I got into the the biggest trouble, Johan, honestly. I got the biggest smack (laughs) of my life because I disobeyed. It wasn't necessarily that I went up there and I disobeyed her her instructions. So one of of those times. Baby Jay, I think that was quite brave of you. I like that story. It's funny, I have that with my parents. If I think about the advice my parents have ever given in my life, um, 
it's almost invariably insane and unhelpful. Um, like, uh, so I, I remember, so my dad, I'm, I'm quite lucky, my dad's from Switzerland. And I'm, um, I'm quite lucky with my dad because and my dad is quite homophobic, but fortunately he hates women more than he hates gays. So when I told him, <laughs> when I told him I was gay when I was a teenager, he's like, ah, oh, son, it is good to our faggot. It means you don't have to deal with these bitches. I was like, oh, thanks dad. That's really nice. That was his way of being encouraging, right? It was like, ah, very good. <laughs> like, uh, so yeah, it's um, very unfortunate. Very unfortunate. I, I was... Yeah. Yeah, I was a very brave and curious kid, but it's interesting when I got to the teenage years, it sort of started to dwindle down. I think that's because I became mm. more of aware of my own mortality. Like when I was mm. when I was a little kid, I would be called the kid with no fear because I'd do crazy, mm. outrageous things, put my body on the line. I used to play cricket and used to play with adults and they used to peg the the hard cricket ball at me and I didn't didn't flinch just smack the damn Whoa. thing uh, into into oblivion <laughs> but yeah wow. as I got older I just noticed that I started to be more cautious and be less likely to do fearful related things and okay. I noticed that as a result social media you name it, whatever, whatever else went on, I started to, my attention started towards those fearful things started to just mm. become more heightened and more aware. And yeah, it was, it was hard. <laughs> it was damaging. So, but these days. Do you, think they were be, Do you think they were connected then that increase in fear was connected to social media? I think so too. Yeah. Because I was bullied mm. on social media. So there mm. was that level of fear associated with, being on social media, yeah, and then having to face the actual kids that were bullying me online mm. at school. So it was like double whammy sort of thing. So I kind of went into my own shell um, because oh, before social that. media, yeah, before social media, like that didn't really happen to me. So there's a mechanism that I think is really worth thinking about in social media that promotes bullying that we can deal with, right? And it's related to this wider attention problem. So obviously to, to understand the ways in which some aspects of our technology are fucking with our attention. Um, I inter went to Silicon Valley and interviewed people who designed a lot of the stuff, the technology that we use, right? And particularly the apps. And as you were saying that, Jay, I was just thinking about one, one mechanism in particular that I think is responsible for so much of our problems. So um, it was explained to me by lots of people who've been at the heart of this machine something I guess I should have known all along. I just hadn't really thought too much about it, which is, so anyone listening, if you open TikTok, Facebook, Twitter now, they immediately start to make money and they make money in two ways. The first is really obvious. You see ads. Okay. We all know how that works. Second way is much more important. Everything you do on social media is scanned and sorted by their artificial intelligence algorithms to figure out who you are. So let's say that you marked that you liked, I don't know, you mentioned that you like Bette Midler, Donald Trump, and you tell your mum you just bought some nappies. Okay, so it figures out if you're a man who likes Bette Midler, you're probably gay. No disrespect to any straight men who like Bette Midler, I've met many. Um, you like Donald Trump, you're probably right wing, and you've just bought nappies. Okay, you've got a baby. They've got tens of thousands of data points like that about you. They know who you are. And they're figuring out who you are partly because they want to let but they want to sell your attention to advertisers so they can target you, right? Someone who sells nappies wants to target someone with babies. No point targeting someone who doesn't. But also they're doing that so they can figure out what the weaknesses in your attention are that will keep you scrolling. Because obviously, the longer you scroll, the, the more money they make, right? So all of their business model is built around figuring out how do we get Jay to pick up his phone more often and scroll as long as possible. That's it. That's their business model. Just like the head of KFC, all he cares about is DJ KFC today. That's it, right? I mean, I'm sure as an individual, he cares about lots of things, but in his professional capacity, that's all he cares about. In the same way, the heads of these companies, all they care about is how do we get you to scroll more and more and more? This isn't, you know, this isn't some conspiracy theory. This is what they say. Sean Parker, one of the biggest initial investors in Facebook, said, we designed Facebook to maximally invade people's attention. We knew what we were doing and we did it anyway. God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. So you can see how that creates a machinery where 
all the algorithms, all of the engineering power, all of this genius in Silicon Valley is just geared towards figuring out the weaknesses in your attention and keeping you hacking and uh, keeping you scrolling. And as everyone will have noticed, it's working really fucking well. They're good at it, right? But where this connects with bullying, and I would argue with, with both individual bullying and the bigger political crisis, is that that business model, which is not how social media has to work, we'll come to that, but that business model, which is designed to figure out what keeps people scrolling, discovered just by accident, it wasn't the intention of anyone at Facebook or Twitter, a truth about human psychology that had actually been known about for about 100 years. And it's a very simple truth. It's called negativity bias. Yep. Human beings will stare longer at things that anger and upset them than they will at things that make them feel good. If you've ever seen a car accident, you know exactly what I mean. You spent longer staring at the car accident than you did staring at the pretty flowers across the street, right? This is very deep in human nature. Ten-week-old babies will spend longer staring at an angry face than a smiling face. It's probably a very good reason in our evolution. Our ancestors who looked out for anger survived better than the people who just stared at the pretty flowers, right? For obvious reasons. But when negativity bias, which is deep in human nature, combines with algorithms designed to keep you scrolling as long as possible, that leads to a horrific outcome. So imagine two teenage girls who go to the same party and go home on the same bus. And one of them opens a social media app and does an update where she says, oh, that was a really nice party. I had a great time. Everyone looked good. And the other teenage girl goes, Karen was a fucking skank at that party. She's a whore. Her boyfriend's a fucking prick. And just does a list of insults towards everyone at the party. The algorithm is scanning for the kind of words that people use. And it'll pick up the first one and it'll put it into a few people's feeds. But it'll pick up the second one and put it into far more people's feeds. Because people are going to stare at that longer. They're going to engage more. What do you mean Karen's a skank? You're a fucking skank. You can see how it was. So I know too well how teenage girls speak because I help my niece a lot with her social media to avoid it. Um, you can see how that, that works, right? It's going to promote the bullying behavior, the angry behavior. Sometimes people say, oh, social media permits bullying. It's much worse than that. Social media, promote, because of these algorithms, social media as it currently works, promotes this bullying. Now that is bad enough at the level of two teenage girls on a bus. We can all see what's happening to teenage girls' mental health. Professor Jean Twenge has done really good research on this. But then imagine that being done to a whole society, except you don't have to imagine it. Look around you. We all know who Donald Trump is, sadly. We all know what Brexit is, sadly. This dynamic of encouraging rage, bullying, anger, refusal to understand each other, which is not just happening on the right, by the way, although it's taking its most toxic form there. Um, you can see how that's fueled. There's lots of things going on, but one of them is that it's fueling these dynamics, right? People who are abusive and angry online get promoted. People who are kind, compassionate, understanding get demoted. If you have a whole society plugged into those dynamics, the society starts to come apart at the seams, which is what we're seeing across the world, right? So yeah, when I think about you as a teenager and you saying that, it's so angering because those algorithms were promoting the nasty things those kids said, whereas the kids who were nice, get they don't get promoted by those algorithms, right? It makes a lot of sense. Now it does. <laughs> uh, and, and hopefully if only you'd people... had an algorithmic critique when you were 12. Yes. Um, <laughs> how different things would be. Uh, it, it just like, I think it's been a lot heightened now as well with more technology, more people being on there. Um, hopefully it does get better and hopefully people listening to this, it does actually make sense. Um, but yeah. Well, you know, I mean, Jay, it's interesting because in a sense, I would say, I totally understand what you say, hopefully it gets better. I would put it differently, which is it will get better if we fight for it to get better because there are solutions. So I'll give you an example of a, a solution from the history of Australia. You, um, when I was a kid, the standard form of petrol in Australia, in Britain, across the world was leaded petrol, right? And a little bit before my time, people used to paint their homes with leaded paint. And it was discovered by scientists that exposure to lead, which obviously if it's being emitted in the car fumes, everyone was getting, um, really fucks your ability to focus and pay attention, particularly for children, right? Exposure to lead is really, really bad for your brain. So scientists discovered this, it's explained to the public and a group 
of ordinary housewives in Australia and in Britain and across the world banded together and said, why are we allowing this? Why are we allowing for-profit companies to fuck up our kids' brains? This is crazy. Mm -hmm. And it's important to notice what they didn't say. They didn't say, so let's ban all paint, right? They didn't say, so let's ban all petrol. They said, let's ban the component in the paint and the petrol that's fucking up our kids' ability to focus and pay attention. It took years. They fought and they fought and they won. You'll notice there is no leaded petrol. It doesn't exist anymore, anywhere in the world, almost anywhere in the world. And, you know, there's no lead paint anywhere in the world now, pretty much. Um, As a result of that change, the Center for Disease Control calculated the average American child is three to five IQ points higher than they would have been had lead not been banned, right? So this is a great model. Something is very widespread that damages people's attention and focus. People identify the specific constituent part that's doing it. They band together, they fight, and they get it out of the atmosphere, right? So really good model for us. So it was really fascinating interviewing people in Silicon Valley to see how that model applies to social media. Because at the moment, um, it's interesting, if you think about how big tech want us to think about this. They want us to frame it as, are you pro-tech or anti-tech? And that framing just makes people fatalistic because you're like, well, obviously I'm not going to be anti-tech. I'm not going to join the army. I should give up my phone and my laptop. So I must, I guess I'm pro-tech, right? That's exactly, just like the lead industry wanted you to ask, well, are you pro-petrol or anti-petrol, right? And you go, guess I'm fucking pro-petrol. I'm just going to have to put up with all this lead pollution, right? It's not, are you pro-tech or anti-tech? The question is not, The question is instead, what tech do we want designed for what purposes serving whose interests, right? And speaking to people in Silicon Valley, this started to fall into place for me. So I interviewed someone called Aza Raskin, who designed a key part of how the internet works. And uh, his actually his dad, his dad, Jeff, Jeff Raskin, designed the Apple Macintosh for Steve Jobs. And Aza said to me, look, if you if you want to deal with this, the solution is really simple. This tech component, you've got to ban the current business model. You've got to say that having a business model that is based on scanning, secretly scanning and surveilling you in order to figure out the weaknesses in your attention, in order to hack them and, you know, and keep you scrolling, that that is just inhuman. It's like lead in, lead in paint. Just don't allow it, ban it. And lots of other people said this to me and it took me a long time to get my head around because I kept saying, well, hang on a minute. What? Well, let's imagine we do that. The next day, when I open Facebook, would it just say, "Sorry, everyone, we've gone fishing"? And he said, "Of course not." What would happen is they would have to move to a different business model. And absolutely, everyone listening has an experience of the two alternative business models they could choose. One of them is subscription. We all know how Netflix works. We pay a certain amount to get access. Or think about the sewers. Before we had sewers. We had shit in the streets, people got cholera. So we all paid to build the sewers together and we all own the sewers together. You own the sewers in Sydney. I own the sewers in London and Las Vegas. We all own the sewers where we live, right? It may be that just like we want to own the sewage pipes together, maybe we want to own the information pipes together because we're getting the equivalent to cholera for our attention. But the key thing to understand is When you move to these different models, whichever one you choose, all the incentives change. At the moment, all the incentives are, how do I hack Jay in order to keep him scrolling? When you move to a different model, suddenly you stop being the product they sell to advertisers, you become the customer. Suddenly they've got to go, huh, what does Jay want? Hmm. Turns out Jay wants to be able to pay attention. Let's design our apps to heal his attention, not hack them. Oh, it turns out Jay wants to meet up with his friends offline because staring at people through a screen makes you feel like shit. Okay, let's design our apps not to keep people scrolling, but to facilitate them meeting offline, right? That's technologically a piece of piss to do, right? People I interviewed in Silicon Valley could design those apps in a week, but you've got to get the incentives right for them to do it, right? Just like the lead industry was never going to go you know what, guys, I think we've made enough money. Let's stop fucking up kids' brains, right? That's not how our capitalist economy works. They had to be made to do it by movements and by regulation. In the same way, we've got to make social media do it, but, but it requires a big shift in 
a shift in how we think. Because when I started researching stolen focus and my attention was getting worse, I blamed myself, right? I was like, oh, you just, your willpower isn't good enough. Why aren't you strong enough? We need to shift from doing that and only asking for individual solutions. So that there are individual solutions that will help, I'm strongly in favor of. But we also need to realize this is something that has been done to us by very powerful forces. And, and we need to realize that we are not medieval peasants begging at the court of King Zuckerberg for a few little crumbs of attention from his table. We are the free citizens of democracies. Those democracies were hard won. We own our own minds. We own our own societies. And we can fucking take them back from these people if we want to. Motivation. <laughs> Just stand up. Let's do it. I nearly said, I nearly said cunts, but I have to be careful because the I also got in trouble in Australia because when I one time when I spoke in Australia, it was the second or third time I came, I said, because my mother's Scottish, I said, one of the reasons I'm always glad to be in Scotland is that Australians are the only people who use the word cunt often enough, apart from Scottish people. And when I did a book signing, someone so I said to them, I always said to people, what do you want me to write? And she said, Will you write you cunt love Johan? So I wrote it. And later that day, she fucking put it on Instagram. So I just it looked like I had just randomly written in someone's book, you can't, right? So and I just, and people were like, oh my God, Johan Hari's horrible. Why did he do that to you? And I was like, so I have to be slightly careful about using the word cunt. But I do feel in Australia is a safe space for the word cunt, right? Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> exactly, it's fine. You know, I love the Australian use of the phrase, you're a good cunt, right? The, <laughs> yeah. like, it's like Glasgow, where my mother's from. The, the worst insult is not, if you said to my mother, how do you get to the post office? You go, all right, go, go at the door here, go right, walk down about 100 meters, you'll see a bunch of cunts standing there, go left where they are, walk down, you see another bunch of cunts, that's the post office, right? But I love it in Glaswegian English, the, um, the true insult is to call someone a cunt hole. So it's not an insult to call someone a cunt, but if you call someone a cunt, did you fucking call me a cunt hole? <laughs> it's like, that's the real insult, right? Which is a great phrase, cunt hole as well. So yeah. Who would have thought adding hole at the end of it? Like, exactly, it somehow like, does make it. Or it. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it 10 times worse. <laughs> it really does. It really oh, does. I don't know why. Funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Johan, man, I do want to be mindful of your time. I know you're very, very tired at the moment. But no, that's right, that's right. The, the final section that I want to do talk cool. about is how do we get our attention back? You've already mentioned uh, one area that we can, which is to fight and not to give up um, and do our very best, like not to give in to tech giants and all this rubbish that's going on. But you also mentioned one of the, the important things it, it before as well is the importance of diet. How is changing our diet yeah. going to impact uh, getting our focus back? So this is, I want to be honest with people, this is the cause that both most surprised me and that I most struggle with, right? I had a KFC yesterday. I think the, the bag is still over in the corner of the room there. So um, uh, I don't know if we've ever talked about this before, but I've ever talked about the one of the real low points in my whole life was in 2009, I went to my local KFC in East London. And it, it was Christmas Eve, which makes this an even sadder, like a fucking Dickensian story. It was lunchtime. And I said my standard order, which is so disgusting, I won't even repeat it. And the guy behind the counter was like, oh, Johan, I'm really glad you're here. I was like, all right. And he went off behind where they fry the chicken and he came back with all the other members of staff who were on that day. And they had a fucking massive Christmas card in which they'd written to our best customer and everyone who worked there had written little personal messages to me. And one of the reasons my heart sank is I thought, this isn't even the fried chicken shop I come to the most, right? How can this possibly have happened? It was a terrible... Anyway, so the way we eat is profoundly damaging our ability to focus. There's this really interesting new movement called nutritional psychiatry that studies how what we eat affects our mental health, the functioning of our brains. It's a super interesting group of people. You should have some of them on. If you want introductions to them, let me know. They're really Please. interesting people. I've got to Umadevi Naidu, who's a fantastic person. There's lot, lots of really great people in this field. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Drew Ramsey, there's some great, great people doing work on this. And I learned from them and from others that there are, there's evidence at the moment for three 
big factors that um, can, that are in the way we eat that are really damaging our focus. So the first is, imagine you eat the standard British, Australian breakfast, what I grew up eating, what you probably grew up eating, which is, um, actually you have a very healthy glow to you, so maybe you didn't grow up eating this, but <laughs> the, so, you know, sugary cereal or yeah, like, you know, white toast with butter on it, right? What that does is it releases a huge amount of energy really quickly into your brain. It releases a lot of glucose, and you're like, whoa, I'm awake, right? I'm up for the day. And it feels like you've actually woken up, right? And it's great. But what happens is that releases so much energy so fast that you get to your desk a couple of hours later, your kid gets to their school desk and your energy just absolutely crashes. And you just experience what's called brain fog where you're sitting there and you're like, oh, you know, you, you just can't think very clearly until you have another sugary carby treat, right? Um, the way we eat puts us on a roller coaster of energy spikes and energy crashes throughout the day that leaves us with long patches of brain fog. The way Dale Pinnock, who's probably Britain's best known nutritionist put it to me, is it's like we're putting rocket fuel into a mini, right? It'll go really quickly and then it'll just stop, right? And whereas if you put in the fuel that it's designed to take, uh, the fuel that humans evolved to have, it will go along quite nicely. So if, for example, you eat porridge in the morning, not sugary cereal, yeah. porridge releases energy steadily throughout the day um, and, and you'll, you won't get brain fog in the same way. So that's one example. The second factor is for your brain to function optimally, you need um, all sorts of nutrients. And our diets are really lacking some of those key nutrients. A famous example is omega-3s, which occur in fresh fish and sardines. And it turns out that, unfortunately, supplements just don't do it, right? It, supplements don't make up, but your body doesn't metabolize nutrients from supplements in the way that it metabolizes nutrients from whole foods. Um, the third way to me is the creepiest, which is it's not just that the food we eat lacks um, the nutrients we need. The food we eat also contains chemicals that act on our bodies like drugs. So for example, there was a study in Southampton here in Britain in 2007, where they took 297 kids and they split them into two groups. And the first group was told, was given, sorry, the first group was given water, just water to drink. And the second group was given water laced with a lot of the synthetic dyes that are found in the food we buy all the time in the supermarket, kind of common candies, all kinds of stuff that kids are eating all the time. And then the kids were monitored and the kids that drank the synthetic dyes were significantly more likely to become manic, to become hyperactive, to have struggle focusing and paying attention. So you can see how these three factors are really damaging our focus and attention. And again, you can see how that has to be tackled at two levels. At one level, obviously individually, we can change our diets, right? Which is, I struggle with, but it can be done. Um, also, we've got to tackle, you know, if you're a parent who wants your kid to eat well, you've got a whole mm. fucking industry working against you. More 18 month old children know what the McDonald's M means than know their own last name. So from the moment we're born, we're trained to associate positive emotions with food that fucks up your body and fucks up your brain. Um, so you can see how we've also got to take on the food industry. There's all sorts of sensible things we can do in terms of regulation, things that countries like the Netherlands have done where they have much lower obesity than Australia and Britain. So there's all sorts of things that we can do and should do. Um, yes, yeah, so again, you've got those, those two levels. I think that was probably one of the two or three factors that most surprised me. Um, yeah. yeah. I think it goes back to as well, being able to fight in terms of the, the different food organizations and companies, because they, and when you walk into a supermarket, you've got all the unhealthy, the sugary mm -hmm. foods out in display. They're much, much easier for us to see. Whereas the good foods, they're hardly anywhere to be seen. You've got to actually walk down an aisle and, you know, try and find them for yourself. And then you've got to deal with the added cost to healthier food. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you, <laughs> you have to be rich in order to eat healthy these days. Totally which I think is completely backwards. But I, I think yeah. if we do get a hold of our diets, I 100% uh, believe you because when I eat junk food, I feel lethargic. All I want to do is sleep and I just don't want to talk to anyone. So if I eat- Welcome to food, my world, Jay. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Poor Johan. <laughs> I know, I know. One of the particular torments of this as well is that, um, because I've been in Vegas for a lot of the pandemic doing research, there's a branch of McDonald's in Vegas that does McDonald's breakfast all day round. And I oh, cannot yeah. tell you, that is like fucking crack to me, right? <laughs> to be able to wake up at like two in the morning and go and get, uh, you know, a uh, hash brown from McDonald's. Oh, I can't tell you. I mean, Vegas is, Vegas is Heaven on earth, man. <laughs> But particularly, yeah, that that temptation is particularly harsh. I can imagine, man. But I was going to say, the last time I spoke to you, I, I think right now you are looking a lot healthier, man. Can I say that? Oh, is thank you allowed, very much. Am I allowed thank to say you. that? Yeah, um, you look like you've lost Unfortunately, weight. the sad truth is the only reason for that is that I've put my laptop on lots of books so it's angled slightly down, which makes me look slightly less fat than I am. <laughs> so sadly, I would love to be able to claim I've made some great improvement in my health. But sadly, I think it is literally just the angle of the camera. I'm sorry. But, uh, angle of the I'll camera the and the lighting. <laughs> it's fine. Thank oh, you. man. You're awesome, dude. Like, um, so what have what have I missed? Oh, sorry. Let me ask you this one. Mind wandering and getting our attention yes. back. Why is my, my mind wandering not such a bad thing when it comes to our attention? This is so interesting because, as, as you know, right at the start of the research for the book, I took three months completely off the internet. Um, I was in this really lucky, I was, I'd come back from Memphis. I was just tired of being wired. I couldn't take it anymore. And I was in the lucky position that um, my, one of my books, my first book, Chasing the Screen, was being made into a film called The United States versus Billie Holiday. So I had a load of money um, and I thought, fuck it. Why am I doing this? This is, I hate this. So I went for three months to a place called Provincetown in Cape Cod, which is a bit like if you imagine Byron Bay, with less surfing and more gays. That's basically <laughs> Provincetown. Um, I was about to say less surfing, more fisting, but I thought that might be too, too extreme. Um, the, it's the kind of place where more than one person makes a living dressing as Ursula, the villain from The Little Mermaid, and singing songs about cunnilingus, right? That's, that's, that gives you a mental picture of Provincetown. Anyway, I went there for three months, and um, I, I left my... I had no, no laptop that could get online and I had no smartphone. And I thought, it comes back to what we were saying before about Spotlight. I thought I had gone there so that I could do more kind of Spotlight focus, right? For example, read all the time. And I was amazed by how much my ability to focus came back. I could read for eight hours a day. I could read like I did when I was 17. But actually the thing that most surprised me in Provincetown was weirdly not that. So when I went, I obviously took a lot of books and I bought a lot of books there, but I also took my iPod, which is so funny because it had seemed like such a futuristic invention when I got it. And by the time I went to Promise Down, it was like something from Noah's Ark, right? Um, but I, and I remember I had these headphones, noise cancelling headphones. And whenever I would switch them on to listen to the iPod, it would always say, searching for Johan's iPhone, searching for Johan's iPhone. And then it would just say very sadly, connection cannot be made. Um, and then about a month in, I decided to just every day go for a walk without the audio books, without, and just, just walk. And it ended up taking more and more of my time to the point where by the end, I was literally going for walks for like four or five hours a day. What was weird was I discovered that I was so much more fertile mentally when I was doing this, when I was just mind wandering. Mm -hmm. And at first I thought, well, this isn't what you came here to do, right? You came here to focus. But after I left Provincetown, <clears throat> I interviewed many of the leading experts on mind wandering in the world, including an incredible man named Professor, Mar named Professor Marcus Reichel, who's a neuroscientist who made some really important breakthroughs on this. And they explained to me that mind wandering, which you know, you're told off at school, oh, daydreaming is one of the worst things you can do at school, right? Actually, mind wandering is an essential form of focus. When you just let your mind wander, you're actually processing your past, you're anticipating the future. You're, you're making connections between things you otherwise wouldn't see the connections between. Actually, mind wandering is an essential form of focus and attention. And in the environment we've created, I'd say we're in the worst of both worlds because we're neither spotlight focusing, where you're deeply paying attention, nor are we mind wandering. We're just fucking jammed up with switching. What was that on Facebook? What's that on Instagram? What's that on the TV? 
wait, what did Jay just ask me? Wait, what's going on? You're just jammed up all the fucking time, which is the least productive form of thinking. Whereas spotlight, what you want to be doing is alternating between your spotlight and mind wandering. Yeah. Um, and so mind wandering is absolutely essential. And of all the chapters, I think that along with food is one of the ones that most surprised me. That was one of my favorite chapters, to be honest, because oh, I'm a, I'm a yeah. big mind wanderer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. My my brain I like saying is kind of like this castle and what goes in it just like it so many things are happening all at once. So I got to focus as much as I possibly can to pay attention in the now, mm. but then the castle is still like expanding itself. Mm. <laughs> if that analogy makes any sense at all to people. Um but yeah, like it's just it. it's just like this yeah, so many things are going into the castle, so many things are going out of the castle all at the same time, but it's my my safe space, if that makes sense. So I hope that I made that analogy properly. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I like it. It's a good but, dungeon. Yeah. Um, anyway, Johan, I do want to be respectful of your time. I really enjoyed oh, no, the conversation. Um, where do you want people to get a copy of your new book, Soul and Focus? I mean, here in Australia, it's everywhere that books can be found. <laughs> so, so I meant to read this fucking thing where I go, my publishers, if you'd like to know where to get the book, <laughs> you can go to stolenfocusbook.com where you can see where to get the audio book, the ebook or the physical book. I meant to say you can get it from all good bookshops, but the truth is you could also get it from a shit bookshop if you wanted to, right? Like we don't have like a quality test where we're like, oh no, your bookshop isn't good enough to stop my book. But um, actually I think I'm not saying this to suck up to Australian bookshops. I think Australia has the best bookshops in the whole world. Australia's bookshops are so beautiful. They're, they're, they're so well curated. Um, so it was chosen by Dimmux as a book of the month and it was uh, Booktopia by book of the month. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm giving them a shout out because they've chosen my book, but you can get it from any, uh, and I'm very grateful to them. You can get it from any, uh, bookshop. Um, what am I, else am I meant to say? I meant to say that if you go to stolenfocusbook.com, you can listen for free to audio with lots of the experts we've mentioned. And I got in trouble at the end of a podcast a while back because the interviewer, so you need to know this interviewer was a 50 year old man before you hear this. The interviewer says to me at the end, so what's your Twitter? And I said it. And he said, what's your Facebook? And I said it. And then he said, what's your um, Instagram? And I said it. And then he said, what's your Snapchat? And I said, I am a 42 year old man, right? The only 42 year old men on Snapchat are certainly pedophiles. Why else would they be there? And he didn't laugh at all. And I was like, I have this terrible thing where people don't laugh. I lean into the joke to try to. So I said, you know, that TV show in America to catch a predator where they sort of catfish pedophiles. I said, um, the next season of to catch a predator should be literally, they just go up to adult men in the street and say, what is your Snapchat profile? And if they have one, just immediately fucking throw them in the back of the van, right? That's it. You don't even need a trial at that point, right? And this guy didn't laugh at all. Later, I looked him up and he is a 50 year old man who is quite prominent on Snapchat. And I was like, so I'm glad we got through this interview without me accidentally calling you a pedophile, Jay. But uh, I, um, yeah. So anyway, people can see where to follow me on social media. Although I will not see you back because I broadcast, but don't receive on social media. I give my assistant the things to, I tell them what I, what I want to say. And then I never fucking look at it almost never because um, I want to be able to pay attention. But anyway, you can follow me there if you want. Amazing. Uh, was it you at the back of the book? I think it was the acknowledgement section. You wrote something to do with, if I've made any spelling mistakes, I apologize. It's not my fault. Oh, yeah, yeah. I yeah, yeah. I always get people to email me if I've made any mistakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, it's really useful actually because sometimes people email you. Uh, well, firstly, you want to be as accurate as possible, but it's actually really nice. You get loads of people who um, we won my other books. One of my old English teachers emailed me to tell me about a spelling mistake. I was like, oh <laughs> fucking hell, it's like a stress dream where your English teacher suddenly reappears after like thirty years, it's going nah, still spelling it wrong, Johan. But uh, but yeah, <laughs> I think that's one of my <laughs> biggest fears. <laughs> When, with my book coming out uh, towards the end of this year, my first one is sending it to one of my old English teachers too. And I'm scouring through and because they taught me English and then them kind of feeling a little bit deflated if they do find anything. It's like, oh, <laughs> whoops, should have taught Jared better. I know someone in Vegas who I'm writing about who is a homicide detective, but she used to be an elementary school teacher and she quit. And, and retrained and became like one of the leading homicide detectives on the homicide squad in Vegas. And she once had to arrest one of her former students. And can you imagine what an absolute head fuck that would be if you commit a crime and suddenly your former elementary school teacher turns up as a cop to arrest you? Like that would absolutely fuck with your head, right? 100%. Um, 
<laughs> I always felt really sorry for. I don't know what the, I can't remember what the criminal did, but I was like, I feel really sorry for that guy. What's your book about, Jay? My book is called The Path of an Eagle: How to Overcome and Lead After Being Knocked Down. So pretty much, uh, I want to help people uh, that have been knocked down to get back up and and move forward in their life. It deals with mental health, so. A lot of the stories that uh, I share in the book, I get very vulnerable. So being sexually abused, having uh, battling addictions, um, you know, depression, anxiety, panic attacks, all these things, and just really showing people, all right, here's a, a unique healing path forward that I call the path of an eagle. Because if you want to be like an eagle, eagles weren't created for the ground. They're created for the skies and to soar. And it's like this beautiful analogy that if you... Uh, are willing and able to do what it takes to get back up and and heal yourself, and it is possible because I've been through some crazy, crazy stuff. Then you will be able to soar in your life. So really, that's the the message of the book, and I hope that people are helped by it. Really, so oh, I'm going to send you a copy. A copy. Oh, I'd I'll love you that, and, um, and you should be really proud of yourself for talking about that so bravely and for overcoming it. And I always think. You know, it's this line I, I think about all the time. Um, Rumi, the um, Persian poet um, in the, I think, the 13th century, he said this amazing line. He said, um, the wound is where the light enters you. You know, I'm sure Leonard Cohen was thinking of that, like he was a big fan of Rumi. I'm sure he was thinking of that when he later said, you know, there's a crack in everything. It's how the light gets in. And I really think that, you know, if you use it right, your traumas and your pain can be points of connection with other people. They can be where the light enters you, right? They can, they can be a place where you become a stronger and better person and you are more empathetic to other people. Clearly that doesn't happen to everyone who goes through trauma. You have to process the trauma in the right way. But I, I really believe that. So I'm so can people pre-order your book? They can right now, actually. Listen, I'll, you can't. I'll, I'll send you. Go and fucking pre-order it now. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first from Johan Harry. Exactly. The, the <laughs> that can be my blur. Himself. Listen, you cunts, <laughs> buy this book. Right? Yeah, I know. You can put it on the cover, right? <laughs> well, you should probably say that about your book, man. Like, <laughs> go and get it right now. Like, you don't have to right. order it. <laughs> but, Johan, man, you've got this new show as well that I wanted to make mention of. It's called. Oh, yeah. Uh, can you please tell people about that show? Because I oh, think. It's um, it, uh, so, it's an adaptation, a documentary. There was a movie adaptation of my book chasing the screen but it was also a documentary adaptation voiced and this is a complete head fuck by samuel l jackson who i really wanted to ask if he would record my answer machine message as his character from pulp fiction but i couldn't bring myself to do it it was too much i was just like this feels weird but yeah it's called the fix it's on rogue the roku channel i think i i should have checked before i think you might need a vpn in australia at the moment it'll probably get an australian broadcaster but anyone who's got a vpn you can watch it if you just you don't even you don't need to have a roku subscription if you just google the fix samuel l jackson it will it'll come up and it's an adaptation and there's lots of weird scenes which cut between me and samuel l jackson which i was like a real really bizarre experience but um but yeah i'm very proud of that actually and i think they did an amazing uh amazing job and um samuel l jackson is insanely hot so there you go <laughs> and that's really thing is, you got him exactly. to narrate uh, an entire series. You may not have gotten him to na narrate your voice message thing. <laughs> but but damn you got it. the entire series, which is like even better. <laughs> so, well done, my awesome. friend. Oh, well done. great. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much Johan, for, for joining me today again on the Storybox podcast. Great. great. Brilliant. So, Jay, send me a book and I'll give you a blurb. <laughs>